afternoon. Welcome to today's keynote. Uh, my name is Ron Reese. I'm the Senior Vice President of Communications for Las Vegas Sands. Uh, it's our pleasure to uh, be uh, part of the host, uh, co hosts for this uh, great event uh, yesterday and today. I hope everybody's enjoying their stay in Las Vegas uh, and at the Venetian. Uh, joining me for our keynote today uh, is a gentleman who has been in the, uh, is really an industry leader. He spent uh, four decades in the hospitality and gaming industry. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. It seems so old. <laughs> I tried to put it another way, but I just kept There's coming no back. No way to, to avoid the, it. Came, came back to the four decades. Uh, but, but is really one of the most respected leaders in, in our industry. Uh, you are sitting in the Venetian Las Vegas, which is really the first integrated resort ever built uh, anywhere. And uh, in concert with our chairman, uh, Rob was responsible for bringing entertainment, food and beverage, uh, retail, all under one roof, that, and, and what really did become uh, the world's first integrated resort, and was the model in which uh, our company pursued Macau, pursued Singapore, and continues to pursue opportunities across the globe. So without further ado, let me introduce the President and Chief Operating Officer of Las Vegas Sands, Mr. Rob Goldstein. Good morning, good afternoon, thank you. As he spoke, I kept thinking he must be speaking about someone else, because that person's so old. But uh, I've been involved uh, very fortunately uh, with this company since the inception. In uh, 1995, I took a journey from uh, the East Coast to join Mr. Adelson uh, here in Las Vegas. Uh, we moved here in December of 1995, and it's been um, two things, both wonderful and too fast. Uh, the years have gone by. I was young back then, and now I'm an elder statesman, I find out. Um, but the journey for us has been nothing short of uh, extraordinary. And the chance to, be, we began here, as Ron talked about, we didn't know in those days that this would become the world's first integrated resort. We called it a big casino hotel with lots of things to do. And uh, Mr. Allison's vision was, was scale. He always preached to us that you want scale. You want lots of everything, lots of food, lots of rooms, lots of meeting space, lots of retail. And that prophecy has served us well all over the globe. Uh, as we've emulated that model both in Macau and Singapore and hopefully other jurisdictions shortly. Um, but I think we learned back then, and it served us well, we went to Macau, that people want large, they want exciting, uh, they want quality, and most importantly, they want a, a resort that offers lots of things, lots of people at a very high level. And that's been our mantra in Macau for all the years we've been there. Uh, our journey began here in Las Vegas, and then we very fortunately got to go to Macau in, in the early 2000s, and we're one of the first, uh, obviously, licensees, American companies. And unlike other companies, we moved very quickly in Macau. Uh, we felt the market was exceptional, and we spent aggressively and, and built big, and we've been rewarded generously by uh, that market. We're very grateful to be there. Um, the other thing about that market that's so interesting is how it mirrors Las Vegas in many ways. Um, I first went to Macau uh, before a lot of you were born. I first went to Macau in 1981. And I was in Hong Kong uh, on business. Uh, I was a young guy. And we took someone and said, have you been to Macau? And I said, no, but I'd love to see it. They said, we have to take the ferry across the water. And I, sure. So we went over that morning. And I remember being shocked at Macau, the amount of people, the amount of uh, excitement. It was gambling at its finest. It was a little rough back then. It wasn't like it is today. It wasn't so refined. It wasn't so uh, diversified. It was mostly gambling. But it shocked me. And to see Chinese people gambling and screaming and yelling, it was very exciting. We were supposed to stay for two hours. I stayed for three days. I couldn't leave. I, uh, I called my wife. I said, bring our clothes and come over. We're going to stay in Macau. Because as much as Hong Kong was the most exciting place I'd ever seen, it was like New York on a much faster level. Um, Macau, for a person in my industry, Macau was the, the magic moment. And uh, I thought about it years later when the licenses became available. It was a, a complete um, dream, that chance to be developed in Macau. And to watch Macau morph into this magnificent destination. I go there quite a bit. And every time I go there, we, it's a long ride, obviously. You're tired. I'm old, as Ron referenced. So I get tired. I'm never going to hear the end of that, am I? No, no, it's fine. <laughs> I, Shoot. I'm, it's okay. I, I'm proud to be old and happy. 
But when I get to Macau, no matter what time of day it is, usually it's nighttime, I'm always shocked by the city's growth. And having been there from 40 years earlier, to see that city evolve into one of the most exciting places on earth. But also I'm shocked by the vast potential that lies ahead. I hope I get to stick around long enough to see it. Because the, what's happened in Macau for us as a company is great. But what's happened to that city, to the people who live there, and to what it's done as a economic engine and a provider of opportunity is shocking and very rewarding. I think Sheldon's vision there uh, to reclaim land and Kotai uh, was exceptional. I think a lot of people at the time found it funny. Um, if you remember Macau in those days, it was when I first went, it was just the peninsula. It was little two acre lots of land, tall high rises, everyone gambling, everyone running around gambling, and, but very small in very few hotel rooms. I used to stay at the Mandarin Oriental. It was the only nice hotel there. And everyone gambled all day and night. And there was no great dining. There was no great retail. There was no great spa. There was no mice. There was no feeling of a resort environment. And to go there now and to look at Kotai and see that magnificent evolution, what's happened in Macau is a, is a lesson in what can be done with with resources, with financial resources spent intelligently to build a destination resort that attracts people all over Asia and, and the world. And to go there now and see spectacular dining and, and, and world-class retail as good as any city in the world, to see the, the mice buildings and the, and the theater we built there, it's just, it still excites me when I go there. I still chuckle to myself as I drive into the hotel, what's happened to Cal in only 20 years? It hasn't happened in 50 or 100 years. It's happened like that. And it shows what governments working together with, with, uh, with partners that have a shared vision for growth. And I think Sheldon's vision there was maybe the greatest call I've ever seen in the history of, of our industry, of what we do for a living in this resort gambling hotel world. That call by Sheldon to go build in Kotai was unequivocally without a doubt, the greatest single call, strategic call in the history of our industry. If you ask anybody in the industry today, it doesn't matter who you talk to, whether they like us, don't like us, love us, hate us, it doesn't matter. It was the greatest single call. But I still believe Macau is in its infancy. It's still just like a, like a 10 year old child that has all the attributes. The child is attractive physically, it's brilliant mentally, it's motivated, it's a, it's a city that has such vast potential ahead of it that as nice as the last 20 years have been, the next 20 should be the evolution of Macau to the, maybe the greatest resort city in the world. And uh, I say that with complete confidence, it can be done. Uh, the, if the government has a shared vision, with whatever the government wants it to be, it can be, and will be, in my opinion. It'll extend far beyond China and far beyond the Pacific Rim as a destination you must see. So that's been my, uh, my, my brief thoughts of 40 years of going to, we were talking earlier about, I've been in China and I've been to Hong Kong 100 times, if not more, and uh, to see Macau reach its potential and what it's done, I think people would think it's, it's there, it's, it's finished, it's just beginning. It's truly just beginning. It's like a magnificent child in the very early days of its, of its life. And we're hoping part of the future development as it morphs beyond even larger destination opportunities than it does today. So Rob, this uh, keynote was, we want to focus on China's greater Bay Area and creating extraordinary opportunities. And I think, you know, you've given everybody a really good overview of where Macau is today. Right. But let's, let's rewind a little bit, talk a little bit about Las Vegas and how maybe sure. Las Vegas can be instructive in terms of, uh, you know, when you got here, what the mindset was uh, how you guys helped change that mindset and how that's potentially instructive to where Macau is and where Macau is going. So not to bore you with my personal history, but my father was a very successful entrepreneur that had one bad habit. He liked to gamble. Um, <laughs> and he used to come to Las Vegas quite a bit. And so I did as a, a child. I came here in the 60s and 70s with my dad. And uh, my first jobs, of you know, silly jobs, uh, uh, cleaning pools and we're here in Las Vegas. Uh, it's a city I, I love, and, and it's been very good to me and, and to my family. But Vegas, if you look what's happened here, 
it's probably the most misunderstood if you uh, understood city in the world. If you ask someone about what Las Vegas is, the average person anywhere in the world, they'll say, "Oh, it's the great the gambling mecca. It's a gambling city with, uh, you know, it's it, it's got all the gambling and it's all the excitement." It, it actually, ironically, is not gambling based anymore. We have gambling. You know, we have these little things called casinos downstairs. But the truth of this has become the greatest hospitality city in the U.S. For it's got 150,000 rooms. It's got over 10 million square foot of meeting space, and it really is dependent on an economic model which is not gaming dependent. The real base, the real core of the investor's reason to be here is because of hotels and other amenities. You couldn't survive. You can't build a hotel like this, which would cost today build billions of dollars, many billions, you couldn't build it on the gambling revenues. They've, they've, gambling has spread throughout the U.S. And what was the forbidden fruit of Las Vegas in the, when I was a kid is gone. You can go to California, you can go east, west, north, or south, anywhere in the U.S. and gamble. There's no place you can't gamble. So what Vegas had when I was young has gone, that elusive, one-of-a-kind experience. So what's Vegas? You, and if I said that to you in 1980, when I was in, first involved in the business in the 80s with Atlantic City, people predicted Las Vegas would blow up. It would cease to exist. And in fact, it did. In the 80s in Las Vegas, there was not one nickel of new development. Not one hotel was built here from 1978 until Steve Wynn built the Mirage 10 years later, in the late 80s. Why is that? The fear was Las Vegas' franchise, which is gambling-based, had eroded and blown up. So no one's investing any money. You couldn't get anybody to put 10 cents in the ground in this city. You could buy land in the strip in those days for nothing. They were giving it away. What happened? Wynn builds the Mirage, a brilliant move. The Mirage was gambling-based, by the way. He, he convinced himself that he could build something that would, in those days, make a million dollars a day, which seemed like an enormous amount of money. Um, and he could build, a, in those days, a $800 million building and be successful. And he was. And that spawned development. Throughout the 90s, the opposite happened. Everybody built, including us. Uh, New York, New York, uh, Luxor, the Venetian, uh, Bellagio, uh, everything was built. Many billions and billions spent in Las Vegas. But ironically, the driving force was a guy named Sheldon Adelson again. The common denominator here is Sheldon's vision for, he said, this is a great city and gambling's important. But non-gambling is really important. You need conventions. You need retail. You need things beyond gambling. You can't live on the gambling fruit. You need other, plant the garden full of other activities. And so we did here. And we built this hotel. It wasn't popular in 1998, 9, to build convention-based. We built this meat space you're sitting in and two million more space like it. And people thought it was hilarious that we have a model based on meetings. If you read the newspaper clippings back then, or you go back and do your history, people made fun of us openly. Large hotel companies said, these guys will be broke. The Mirage people used to come across the bridge and say, you'll be broke in six months. It's a gambling town. Well, if they were right, we'd all be broke together. Because today, gambling has just flattened out in Las Vegas, and it doesn't, hasn't grown in years. But the, but the hotel business has boomed. The retail business, the nightclub business, the restaurant business, entertainment has boomed. And Las Vegas has more affluence, more earning potential today than it ever had in the best days of gambling. As I watch Macau, what's so spectacular about it is I can't help but think, I'm one of the few people that think this way, as I look at Macau, I'm always fascinated by the parallels to Las Vegas. But Las Vegas has stalled because gambling is spread throughout the entire United States of America. So, there is no potential for someone to build a $5 billion hotel in Las Vegas today because the gambling money is gone. It's flattened out. The growth potential is not there. Macau has the ability to be all three things that even we can't become in Las Vegas. One, it is the biggest gambling city in, in the world, by far. In fact, it's the first top 10. There's no place like it. If you add up all the other cities, it doesn't even compare. So Macau, clearly, with a huge population base in the Pacific Rim, not just in China, but throughout the rim, has attracted world-class gambling. It's proved that point. But we believe the potential of Macau with the new bridge and, of course, the access to Hong Kong Airport and the ability of, of building more hotel rooms 
and more convention space, we believe it should become the world's greatest convention-based uh, city. Um, people want to go to Macau. Gambling and all the activities dovetail nicely with what happens in convention space. What do people want in conventions? They want a place to work. Like today, you all spend your days in these rooms thinking, working, networking, and creating value for yourself and your companies. At night, you'll go out for dinner. You'll continue the business activity. Our business is the same way. People come here for leisure, have the same desires. They want to eat, have fun, go to shows, have back nightclub activities. Macau could become and will become the greatest destination, perhaps at least in Asia, if not the world, if it wants to. It needs more hotel rooms. It needs more entertainment. It may need more museums. It may need more nightclubs. But inevitably, Macau has the economic ability to far surpass Las Vegas and become something that is dramatic. It also, the third leg of that thinking, is when you're in the, in the gambling world or you're in the uh, convention world, there's also the FIT world, for independent travelers, who just on their own, without having a real reason, they're not gamblers, they're not really, not, they're not people coming for uh, convention, they're coming for fun. They're coming to eat, drink, see shows, experience a fun city. There's no place like it in Macau, in, in the Pacific Rim, has diversity of product, quality hotel rooms. The rooms being built in Macau are the best in the world. We're about to build, we're about to finish a, a Four Seasons. There's no Four Seasons like when we just built Macau. The new Morpheus Hotel is extraordinary. The new Wynn Hotel. There's billions, tens of billions of dollars being deployed in capital, creating such enormous opportunities to create spaces you couldn't afford to build any place in the world. You couldn't build it in Paris, you couldn't build it in New York, you only build it in Macau. It's happening as we speak. The quality of product in Macau is exemplary. The food and beverage, the amount of fine dining restaurants in Macau, <laughs> exemplary. In the old days, you couldn't find a place to eat. It was just very basic in Macau. Today, the options are endless. We're, we must have under construction at any one time a dozen new restaurants, and they're all extraordinary. And every type of cuisine. We have a Four Seasons spa. It's extraordinary. We have convention space. We have an arena that features the greatest acts in the world. The arena is so popular, I get calls from entertainment people complaining they can't get a date because every weekend we have a top star, either Asian-based or, or a, a North American star, but every weekend, 45 weeks a year, it's booked. The point is, Macau can be whatever it wants to be. It can be the top gaming, gaming destination in the world, the top FIT destination in the world, the top MICE destination in the world. What it needs is more hotel rooms. It's already got the infrastructure. It's already got the bridge, which is enormously, and the bridge is beyond spectacular. What an achievement that is. But it, more important, it opens the door to that airport, which can mean anybody from the rim or the world can find that airport and come right to Macau. And I promise you, it sounds funny to say, but try to find a hotel accommodation of the quality of Macau in, in Paris or London or New York or Beijing. You can't do it. The quality of rooms being built there, the quality of spas, the quality of food, the quality of entertainment, it's, it's unbelievable. And it will only get better in time. If the government wants it to happen, it can. The question I have is how much, it needs more land, it needs more hotel rooms, it needs more of everything to keep growing. Just like this city, which has 150,000 sleeping rooms of diverse quality, enables it to appeal to any convention group in the world. Macau needs to have more rooms to appeal to every convention group in the rim or throughout the world. People want to go to Macau because it's got such great offerings, but it has, they need a place to sleep, a place to have shows like this. There's more space in this building than all of Macau. We need to build more convention space, many more square feet, million square feet, more theaters, more sports. I think it needs a golf course of top quality. It needs more arenas. It needs more spas. It needs more of everything because demand is insatiable. And, and as I parallel these two cities, Las Vegas, in 1998, was kind of like where Macau is today, more gambling dependent. But it will go beyond Las Vegas, far beyond Las Vegas, and become a city with gambling, incredible retail, incredible mice, incredible FIT. There's no, no boundaries to control Macau's future. It's endless, and that's part of the entire rim. So you've given a pretty good overview in terms of, you look back at Las Vegas when you started here, and, and yes. uh, the you know, the analogy you gave of people laughing at you and Mr. Adelson and the team for building... Mostly him, it was his idea. Building, building the, uh, 
the meetings, incentive, convention, exhibition, the mice. Yes. You know, a term we really didn't start using until no. we were, were, were in Asia. We were in Asia when they told us, you're mice people. What's that? We thought they were insulting us. We're mice. Rats? Mice. No, meetings, incentive, convention. And Sheldon said, make a note. That's a good term. We never heard the term mice here. It came out of Asia. Do you see, Rob, do you see, uh, you know, you, you look back at those days in Las Vegas and where Macau is, and let's, let's talk specifically about mice because yep. in terms of opportunity for the greater Bay Area, uh, the mice opportunity, you know, the one thing you certainly saw in Las Vegas after, after this company built this convention space was a run on other companies building convention space right. in, the, in this city. Sure. Do you see that happening in Macau, and if not, what's, what's preventing it, and what's the opportunity specific to mice in terms of growing, growing that segment? That's a great question. The only problem in Macau is it's so, it's so rich in opportunity. You know, the, the problem with operators there is they only have enough rooms. They all, what's the one thing everyone wants in Macau desperately, if you're in my chair? Rooms, suites, accommodations. The most value we built because Sheldon believed that that market was driven by scale. We have 13,000 plus rooms. Other people built very small hotels, and it's a, it was a huge mistake, and they're paying a big price for it today because that city could, could tomorrow double its hotel capacity and still stay full. It could have 100,000 rooms, and when it does, if the government wants that, it will become the mice destination for Asia without a doubt. People want to use Macau. The, the old days of taking the water was a big impediment. Taking the, you know, it's tough to take that, that, that uh, ferry, but today with the bridge, that's no longer an issue. So if the government decides to let people build more hotel rooms, if the government wants more golf courses, if the government wants museums, whatever they want, people will build. We are anxious to invest more in Macau. You know, Sheldon would be thrilled to make big checks to the, to the, the, the opportunities in Macau. We see the opportunities to be endless, and we see them in multiple categories beyond gambling. We see them in mice. We'd love to emulate what we've done here and make it a mice destination midweek. We love to build more entertainment capacity. Um, and so would our competitors. There is no end to what Macau could become. And, and as an economic engine, as a multiplier effect for the region, it's extraordinary. Macau should be the driver of more opportunity, not just in Macau, but the entire you know, region should benefit enormously. Imagine having multi-million dollar conferences every week. Imagine having the kind of entertainment we could bring to Macau. We, we have one arena. Wish we had five, because the, the acts want to come, demand is there. Um, the growth opportunities of Macau are so far beyond what Las Vegas has that it's, it's incomparable. This is a wonderful city, but it's limited by, it's already done most, it's growing, it's happening for the most part. It can't grow like it has in the past. Its greatest growth spurt was the 90s and up to 2007 or 8. With gambling flattening out and the business of mice being saturated with 10 million feet, there isn't that kind of growth. Macau could be dominant in every category, including mice and FIT. It could be the number one destination for Asians, not just Chinese, but for Koreans, Japanese, people all over the rim to come visit. Because again, you don't have that kind of uh, opportunity in any other city to have that scale of having 100,000 sleeping rooms and a complete tourist dominant destination. You know, if you haven't been to Macau recently, you haven't been to Macau. Those who have been there five years ago haven't been to Macau. It's a whole different place. And I always chuckle at the, the luxury offerings in Macau are so extraordinary in such a small period of time. If you're there in the 90s and you look at what Macau has become today, extraordinary. The parallels between these two cities are, are fascinating. But I think Macau in the next 10 or 15 years, if the government so wants it to happen, could be an extraordinary city for the, for the years and years to come. There's no, there's no, nothing to stop it. Uh, you spend a lot of time talking about the amount of private investment that's gone in, in, yeah. in Macau over the last 10 or 15 years. Certainly, Sands has put, you know, north of $13 billion into Macau, and, uh, you know, several other companies have put in smaller amounts, but there's probably 20 to, well, probably 30 to $40 billion worth of total private investment there. You've talked about uh, uh, increased uh, obviously, the bridge. You've talked about increased capacity sure. at the airport, transportation. Um, you also spend a lot of your time flying around uh, other markets, talking to governments about opportunities in places like Japan or Korea. How important is it to have that private-public partnership, having a relationship sure. with the government 
uh, that knows that those investments are going to drive all the things that they're trying to achieve. Sure, it's critical, well. absolutely critical. The, the, the leadership in, in Macau and the government there, I mean, let's say the vision there to bring companies there 20 years ago, and even today, to let that city grow and improve is pivotal. To have a government partner that wants us to grow and wants us to, and can give us instruction and guidance as to what they want us to be. So I think the, the Macanese government has done an extraordinary job of helping us think through what they want to be. But think what they did. They took a very small industry. We got to Macau in 2004. We opened our first building. The entire gross gaining revenues in Macau is about $3 billion U.S. Today it surpasses $40 billion. That government had vision to see what it could be. The next government there has to have vision to see what it could be beyond gambling. The, the, the gambling business will be fine. The next, the next thing to fall there, successfully fall, is to conquer the mice space and to be what you have here in Las Vegas, a mice economy that creates business people coming all the time into the market and spending lots of money. It's a great market for any hotel company, any company wants to grow. And the, the next leg is the FIT. If the government is willing and cooperative and wants to help us grow, there's no indoor capital in Macau. And, but to, to Ron's point, private companies, <clears throat> public companies, we have our own agenda. We want to make money and grow. But it takes a government with leadership and vision to enable that vision to come to reality. And our vision has to dovetail with the government's vision. And we're, we're anxious for the new government, the new uh, CEO of Macau is going to take uh, his, his position shortly. I think the future Macau is contingent upon the Macau government's willingness or desire to see it grow beyond uh, what it is today. If they had that vision, there'd be a lack of, of, uh, of public money um, or private money that will come to Macau and spend it. That city, where I saw in 1981, is gone. That city is long gone. The city of the future is there today, and the growth potential of that city is, is uh, without equal anywhere. You're sitting in a great city, but we have kind of <clears throat> gotten to the point where growth is more difficult for us here. <clears throat> Macau doesn't have that impediment. And hopefully we can work with the government to realize more success for that city and for the, Pacific, for the entire rim. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you have, <coughs> when you talk about, and this, and this probably be our last, uh, last question, we're running a little short on time. Uh, when you <coughs> talk about the impact on Macau, but also you think about the potential impact, particularly Greater Bay Area, uh, maybe even as close as Zhuhai and Henshin <coughs> Island. You know, what are the opportunities for Macau to have that impact uh, on those, you know, on surrounding parts of the Greater Bay region? Obviously, they're, they're huge because when we do things in Macau, it carries out for miles and for dollars around. And again, we do in Macau, I think, has huge impact the entire area. It doesn't just stop in Macau; it grows far beyond Macau. The multiplier impacts of the economy. The growth opportunities beyond Macau, incalculable. The same would happen in Nevada or other cities. When you're as successful in Macau, everyone in the region benefits. And we think that's, that's obvious to look at and see. And the unemployment or lack thereof in Macau, the success of the Mackinac people. We employ 33,000 people in Macau. And we've really brought, I think, some great thought process and be it how we pay, how we train, how we grow talent there. Um, I think we've done, I'm very proud of our efforts in Macau. When I'm there, our employees come up and talk about things we've done, be it benefits, be it uh, <clears throat> training, employee cafeterias, things were never there. So again, to the government's credit, we have initiated things in Macau that never would have happened prior to us coming. And it's, it translates throughout the entire region. And the, the employment opportunities, the growth, the economic engine that Macau is, is far beyond Macau's borders. So. What's, uh, last question, uh, you talked about, you've told everybody that your first trip was 1981. Yeah. You've been there a lot, obviously, since. Yeah. Uh, as you know, I told you, I just was there at the beginning of last week, was amazed, uh, you know, by one particular. What, what's surprised you maybe the most of, I was, you know, shocked to see the amount of retail, the high-end retail, and people everywhere in the retail. Right. Is there something that surprised you the most? over you know, the, the 17 years that Sands has been there or yeah. going back to your first trip? Yeah, the, the thing that surprised me most is how, how the competitors and the people in Macau at that time didn't see. We built the first hotel, the Venetian. I just looking at pictures I took in 2005 and six as you built the Venetian. And people used to call me up and say, you guys are crazy. No one wants to sleep in Macau. There's no need for a hotel room there. No one wants to shop in Macau. 
And why build nice restaurants? Just they, they want to eat at the table and gamble. And why you build a fancy spa at the Four Seasons? The, the thinking was that Macau was a, a one-trick pony. And what shocks me is the lack of vision. People didn't see it. They used to laugh at us and say, no one's ever going to sleep in the Venetian shop. We opened the hotel and someone said, this hotel will be bankrupt in six months. The Chinese people do not want to sleep here, eat here. They just want to gamble and go home. Well, they couldn't be more wrong. And the lack of vision at that time is still shocks me that people in the U.S. didn't see it, didn't see the parallels to Las Vegas. And I think today, people see it loud and clear. Uh, it's completely, but those days to me, it was still amazing how people didn't realize the opportunity in Macau. Sheldon saw it, we capitalized on it, and we see it today as a much, much broader opportunity for the next 10, 15 years. And it really depends on the government's vision if they share ours, and we're hoping they do. But for the entire area around Macau, the opportunities are just, they're endless. They're exciting. Hope we're, be, we're there to be a part of it. Hope you are too. So. All right, we'll leave it there. Thanks Thank everybody you. for your uh, participation today.